Welcome back. Thank you once again for hanging out with us. This is the one and only IT in the D show. I'm your host, Bob Walton Spiel, hanging out co-host producer extraordinaire randy walker who just literally did a 10-hour drive back from memphis and uh he's uh literally parked and hit the record button for us so we appreciate you randy uh it was actually like 12 oh god guess guess this week zach boguslowski we're going to be talking about transitioning from the military to it we're going to be getting into some cliches that he hates and we're going to be talking about uh, uh a thing i did called slalom speaks where he was my mentor should be a fun conversation. You can find us online, it in the d.com and do us a favor, give us a like on the socials and subscribe to us everywhere. Fine podcasts are sold. Next event, November 17th. We're gonna are we gonna do this again at uh 54 West and Claus and Randy because uh they set up trivia like at 7 30 and I felt it felt awkward. So I don't know if everybody else felt the same way. Yeah, let's do the one more time that we have booked and then let's find a new venue for December going forward. Yeah, I think so too. We uh, definitely need a new venue, but it'll be at Fifty Four Weston Claus and had a, had a nice little event uh, last week. Good, good conversations. Appreciate y'all coming out. So, uh, Zach, how you doing? How are they treating you? Oh, uh, you know, as good as as good as a whip dog gets. So, but uh, no, all good, all good. Uh, doing interesting work for 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 a good check. So you can't complain about that. No doubt. So it's funny to me. Every not really funny, but it's interesting to me every time. I speak with someone that's ex-military that's in IT. They're absolutely on the ball with it. And they, they they take it more serious than the people that have been, like I was raised in it, right? 300 baud modem at 13 years old. Pretty much everyone that I work with from an engineering standpoint, raised in it. We we're born into it, right? We're like Bane. You know, I was, you know, I wasn't molded. I wasn't molded. I was born into it. Um, but then you find people that were like ex-military and they're, I don't know if it's the regimen, if it's the discipline, if it's the thankful to get out into the private sector finally. Um, I mean, I guess tell me tell me about your story. You know, I guess your military background and how you transitioned into IT. Yeah, so uh, appreciate that, and I hope I'm not the one that uh, the one outlier there that's not on the ball with with everything. So hopefully that <laughs> hopefully that's not true. Uh, so yeah, for the quick synopsis, you know, I. I uh, was lucky enough to go to the Naval Academy of Annapolis, all that good stuff. And I got to pick up uh, a, bil- a, uh, a spot in flight school. So I, could, I got to go fly. Uh, so I got to fly around in a big, ugly old aircraft called the P-3 Orion, hunted submarines, did intelligence and surveillance, all sorts of fun stuff. And I think that's kind of where the IT side of me really lit because of stuff we didn't have. Um, these birds had, you know, the old green screens and big honking buttons to push to get anything done. And then the update was, if you guys remember, the old orange touchscreens that you saw in 1970s, mid-70s, late-70s machines. That's what was considered the high-tech update. Um, So no plane I flew on was less than uh, 25, 30 years old. Uh, After that, went and did a number of other jobs and and such. And as I transitioned off active duty, I worked with a headhunter, did my interviews, did everything else, and got hired uh, as an IT project manager. Uh, and I took the job. It was in Reading, Pennsylvania. And I asked uh, my boss at the time who hired me, and I asked her, I said, you know, I'm not an IT guy. Like you just said, I wasn't born into it. I don't know the first thing about how to configure a switch. Um, I can barely spell HTTPS. So what What else you know, what, what are you trying to do here? And she goes, Zach, it's like three sides of a triangle. There's leadership, there's getting stuff done, and then there's the IT knowledge. We can teach you that top part. I need people who can do the other two. And after working with this group of folks uh, for probably five, six months, I said, this is it. This is where I want to work. I get, I understood what they were, what they were trying to get done and, uh, and really kind of stuck with it. When I found myself Outside of IT and project management work, I've always found myself trying to come back to it, trying to make things more efficient. And how do you make things more efficient? You use better technology, you use better stuff. Uh, so that's kind of how I found myself uh, all the way up until getting hired at Slalom. It's it's funny. It just reminded me of – so I I remember hiring a guy who was uh, in National Guard ex-military uh, to run a help desk, and he killed it. And he didn't know everything, um, but he knew where to find stuff in KBs, and he was completely disciplined. Um, I got another friend who I uh, mentored into starting it with an AWS uh, dev, DevOps shop. And he was a bodybuilder professional wrestler. And 
they put out in front of him what he needed to do in the discipline and, and he's absolutely killing it. He hasn't missed an MBO in five years. And it's, you know, you wonder, is there that que- I never really asked that question and you don't really know until you put somebody in the, I guess, you know, pardon the pun, but the line of fire, you know, can you, how do you find out that someone's got that, that, that discipline, that, that regimen, you know what I mean? That it would be successful. And because yeah. again, I think everyone's looking for it and it's hard to find. Yeah, I think it's it's re- it really is hard to find, and I, and I can't say that every veteran has it because certainly they don't. I mean, that would be, you know, it's a positive stereotype, but it's still a stereotype. It's wrong. Uh, I think one thing that helps with a lot of veterans, you know, getting you know kind of thrown in you know out of the fryer and into the fire a little bit, is that we are constantly changing jobs, not just every three years, but every interim period there too. Every twelve to eighteen months, you're going to do something different. So, for example, my story. My first ground job at the squadron, I was the classified publications librarian. So I managed about half a ton worth of stuff in 12 big boxes, charts, books, pamphlets, you know, code cards, things like that. And that was my job was to manage all of that. So very technical, very or, um, organized, very compliance based. And they said, OK, Zach, you've done that for nine months. Um, you're moving up in the squadron. You get a little more senior. Now you're the public affairs officer. If you couldn't go from one extreme of opposite to the other, I don't know how you could going from don't talk about anything to talk about everything that we're doing as, as the PAO um, and then becoming the admin uh, assistant department heads not, not long after that. So I think by having to do that, you have to pick it up very quickly. And I think it's that agility, for lack of a better term, and that determination to say, OK, you put me in this job. You trust me with this job. I've got to do better than the last guy. And the last game, my, my guy may have killed it. He may have been awful at it, but you just want to do it 1% or more better than the last guy. And that's why we, I think you see a lot of veterans succeed when they get into IT without having much of an IT background because they can be taught like a blank sheet of paper as opposed to folks who have been doing it for years and years and years and have those preconceived notions. That's been my running joke for like the last 15 years. I said, if you hate your job, just wait six months. It'll completely change. Yeah. Um, no, ma- I don't even care what you do. If you're in tech, if you're in sales, if you're in marketing, if you're in leadership, it, you know, it'll completely change. And that's the one thing I, it's funny. The one thing I learned, you know, I've been in leadership with the last four or five years or so and, and, and hired a fair amount of people, not a ton, but a fair amount. And I used to always ask the question and I had it set in my head that I wanted someone born into it. Like, what do you do on the weekends? I want it to be like, I want you to be a, like a, just an Uber nerd. I want you to like, Oh, I tinker with my Raspberry Pi stuff in the basement or yes, I'm, you know, I watch sci-fi movies until my eyes bleed, you know, like that, you know what I mean? Like, and then I got completely, I, we spoke, uh, Randy and I spoke at PenguinCon on like how to get a job in it completely 100% got contradicted. And I just, it kind of opened up my eyes cause I'm like, maybe it's not, you know, that's what I'm looking for, but it's not what everyone's looking for. So it's, sure. it's interesting. It depends on all you know, getting into the industry on who you're talking to. Right. Because if yeah. you had told me I unplug at five and I go fishing with my kids, you know, again, it doesn't mean you can't do a poor job, but I'm not going to look at you like I would look at the nerd, you know? Sure. Yeah. And, and I think that's absolutely right. Like if I, if you looked at what I do for hobbies, you know, I coach a high school baseball team and, you know, I'm a season ticket holder for the tigers and, you know, I read and I don't watch a ton of TV. I watch some, but I don't watch a ton of TV you know, you'd never think that I work for a tech consulting firm uh, and and love it and absolutely, you know, enjoy my job. You'd never, never, ever think that. But I think part of it is also that desire to learn more about it, too. And I think that's where that inkling of that that person, that stuff you're looking for, for that drive and that motivation to learn and pick it up. It's it's those people who could put kind of work here, life here, and they don't overlap very often. They're very passionate about what they do for work. But then when work's done, like you said, it's over. Um, that said, there's plenty of those Uber nerds out there who are phenomenal people who are phenomenal at their jobs. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I always, you know, I always look at it as if I don't have one or two aha moments during my week, I did something wrong. Like whether I learned something new or, or found a new buzzword or I found a new tool or something, because nobody can know everything. I, I was talking to somebody at the event last week that's in security. And I said, just the vendor matrix that these CISOs have to look at. And I go, it's not like there's not one thing to do. So we were joking about all you got to do is walk in and say DevOps and zero trust and you'll get people to listen to you. Um, and we'll get into that in a minute. But like nobody does one thing like you need to buy this layered 
you know, I, I couldn't imagine what they have to go through in terms of how many reps they have to get called call on them just to get a decent stack. Um, so speaking of buzzwords, you know, your life, everything is uh, business outcomes and digital transformation <laughs> to the point where if you probably hear it, you're, you're, you're literally throwing up. Um, pretty close. How do you not say it in any given day? And I guess let's, I want to dive into like the whole business outcome thing. Cause I'm, I'm fascinated by it because I always thought I sold business outcomes even back in the old days when I sold network switches, we would figure out a way. Oh, I just saved you half a million on your network cost. That's a business outcome, but it's not. I guess I, I want to dive in with you. What, what, you know, how do you go about like preaching and, and getting to a b- true business outcome? Yeah, for me, when I when I get in there and, and talk about it, I try to avoid like like so many people do those buzzwords, business outcomes. I don't talk about ROI unless it's absolutely necessity. You know, things like that. The way I look at it is, I take a very personal approach to it and look at it as. The business outcome is, are you making the customer's, you know, frontline individual life any easier for them, either in front of them on the screen or taking time off a process in the back end or somewhere in between? And so when I talk about business outcomes or solutions, it's more like problem solving. I'm just here to put the puzzle pieces together and what the picture looks like, that's up to you. But I'm putting it together upside down. So when you turn it over and that's the picture that you're looking for. Okay, that's great. I'm just here to help you solve the puzzle and put the pieces together. But what you want it to look like, that's up to your business, at least from the, the, the position I'm in right now as far as outcomes go, um, without sounding overly technical. I think that's the other part. No, no, and we don't need to get technical because this isn't the technical part. But like no. for me, it's fascinating getting a Fortune 100 company to write a big check to a small local company to do stuff that they've hired people to do it in house. Mm -hmm. What's that conversation like to say, no, you use me. Are you, is it the, (laughs) is it that brilliant idea you're bringing to the table? Cause obviously you can't show your cards too much cause they'll do it in house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, What's that look like? For me, it, it looks very much not necessary. a Hey, look at me. I'm better than everyone. I think that's something that we do very well is that we don't do that. Uh, like some of the big four do or some like the the McKinsey's and the Baines do is they, you know, they they rest on their their reputation for us. And for me specifically, it's more of a I'm coming at this with fresh eyes. You've been staring at this problem for three, six, nine months, a year and haven't gotten anywhere. Let's tag in and see what a person with fresh eyes, maybe with a little less technical experience, but a little bit more broad, you know, varied experience might see and talk in terms of. What do you want this thing to do? What do you want this system to produce for you? How do you want to do business when you're at, when you're doing business? How do you want your job to run? Um, and then just start the conversation from there. And again, in current engagement, that's exactly what we've done is, you know, what's the process look like for you? Well, and lots of pushback. Well, the process works fine, mostly. I'm not here to re- reinvent the whole damn thing. If it works, I'm not going to break it. Legacy systems are there for a reason because they work. You know, you have to respect the legacy system. But that being said, everything you could use an upgrade. Everything you could use a little bit more efficiency. I'm not saying go full Toyota Six Sigma lean efficiency. I'm talking, can we get rid of two pieces of paper and turn it into a form online? That little bit means everything to the, some of these ladies and ladies and gentlemen who are who are working nine, 10, 12 hours a day. If they can save 10 minutes to go grab an extra cup of coffee, that's a that's worth the check that their boss just cut for us to come in. Because then they're happier and then they work more efficiently because they've got a few extra minutes to take a breath. So how do you judge worker sat? Is it a turnover thing? Because, you know, that that yeah. seems like a tough thing to judge. If you got somebody that's collecting a check, they, they don't leave. Um, they might be, you know, they, it might be prison to them, but they can't, you know, <laughs> they got to feed their kids. Can, sure. Is there a way to accu- accurately judge that? No. <laughs> Fair. To be honest. Fair. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it is a subjective measure, right? Like you can't there's no real metric or 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 measurable or OKR or, or KPI or whatever term you want to use to measure, you know, worker or employee sat. The same as there isn't really one to measure uh in, you know, uh consultant sat sat for what we do. It's all kind of how does it feel? And I think the last guy I worked with, uh, you know, I asked him a very similar question. He goes, 
you kind of just got to feel around the edges. And if it's squishy, that's bad. If it's, you know, good, if it's squishy, it's bad. If it's not, that's okay. Cause I mean, they're, they're, you know, there's, it's, they're putting the muscle on and it's going, going good from there. It's disgusting, I listen, by the way. It is disgusting, but it's, but, but if it works, it works. Right. So, right. Right. But uh, I think the biggest thing for me is just listen, tone of voice. Are they repeating the same problems over and over and over again? Are they going backwards? You know, we've done this before. We've had someone take off her watch to tell it what time it tell us what time it is. If you hear that constantly over the course of your engagement, you're not getting it. Something's not clicking. When that starts to go away and they start to ask more in-depth process-based questions, you've got their attention. Now, that's when the iron's hot. That's when you have to strike and say, here's what we're going to do. But it takes time to get there. And There's a lot of it philosophy because I'm looking at like all I'm reading now is con- contradictory reports on work from home. Mm-hmm. Some state nobody's been more productive. Some people are like, nope, I want you to, you know, some companies in Detroit are like three days a week. You need to be in this office with your butt in that seat. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, I don't like I said, is that just is, you know, are we just throwing darts or is there some science to it? I think it's a little bit of both. I think it, there's some science to it, but you can't see the dartboard. You know it's there, but it's in the dark. But the fact that we know it's there gives us a chance to maybe hit the target once out of every, say, five times, as opposed to once out of every 25, when we have no clue where it is. We know it's in front of us. So I think as far as work philosophy goes, be it remote, hybrid, completely on site, that's a very individual decision. Um, Some people, and and again, I won't even go generational. I I, I won't even say that. Millennials do one thing, Gen Z does another, Gen X and, and boomers do a third and a fourth. There's plenty of mix and mash in there uh, for that. I think it's a very personal thing of what works best for you. And I think that's why you saw a lot of this great recession, this quiet quitting nonsense, because you have folks my age who are hell bent on going back to the office, but they work in an environment where remote is actually applauded and they want to find something different. And vice versa, there might be some young 22-year-old out there who's been told you get to work remote, it's flexible, it's great, and they want the rigor. They want that security of a, of a desk and a plant and a cubicle and 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 fluorescent lighting, and they want that. And, and I think it's a very personal thing. So to answer your question, philosophy, yes, but on a much more micro level than macro level. See, I think it's a, I think it's a, you need to find out how. Um, yeah. I, you know, I worked for a company that wanted you button seat. Well, I had somebody that was former military PTSD bipolar was open about it and smartest guy in the room, meaning shoulder taps all day. And I gave him, I would let him like come in late or call, you know, or leave early, which was forbidden because they, you know, it was punching, you know, everyone's punching. Oh yeah. Because he would code at three in the morning in the dark in the basement and put out his best work. Mm-hmm. And it, it's figuring that out. Like me, you know, I've been in, rem- I've been working f- from home remote since Oh three. I think when the first time they gave me keys to a company car and said, you own the Midwest go, you know, I have my double 27s here. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. At home. So when I'm like, now I'm crunching spreadsheets and I'm getting power BI, right. I'm like, I'm in my, you know, when I'm in the office, Oh, hey, there's so-and-so. What's up? You know, did you see the Tiger game last night? You know what I mean? There's it's mm-hmm. like, I feel like there's a miss. I don't know. I'm getting off on a tangent here, but no. you know, I, it's kind of going back to the crux of how do you find out these business problems, right? And I think that was kind of my whole point is yeah, it's, uh, you know, finding out again, pointing it out and then having someone agree to it, right? Because if you, if you, yep. you know, and, and it's having the right person agree to it, too. You can have the most junior guy on the team that nobody respects. Go, oh, that makes sense. And shut up, junior. Go go sit in the corner and color. Uh, right, right. You know, or conversely, sometimes the most senior person agrees with you. They'll say, well, of course, they agree with, with Zach because they signed the check to bring him in. <laughs> so you got to find that who's that influencer, for lack of a better term, in the middle there. And a lot of times it's that, like you mentioned, that person, that man or woman who's been there 15, 20 years has been punching a clock regularly, is just working for the gold watch, brings the same brown bag to lunch, to eats at the same spot, goes home and pets the same dog and feeds the same fish, and has been for the last 20 years. A lot of times that person 
carries a huge weight with them of influence and 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 I don't even know what the other word is, but influence. Um, it can really get people's attention. If you get that person to even crick their neck a little go, that's interesting. All of a sudden, the whole room goes, whoa. You got him to move. You got him to speak. You got her to, to change your mind. Huge deal. Yeah, fun, my man. First yep. I'm old man, but it, you know, if you don't know, look it up. <laughs> Randy doesn't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Detroit's always a laggard when it comes to East and West Coast. I've, this has been my whole career. Mm-hmm. Where so like I'm always looking what's going on in Silicon Valley, what's going on in New York, and in in two years it's going to trickle here, but I want to stay ahead of it. Yeah. What's uh, what do you see in terms of trends, at least on the business consulting side, or at least on the from I, obviously data, everything's moving to data in motion, and and you know then privileged account, you know the whole security world. Cl- is cloud much? You think cloud is mature? Then all of a sudden you have organizations that you thought were way deep into it are just getting migrated. Oh yeah. What what do you see as some of the trends or is it, you know, is it just, is it dependent on the, on the client or do you see anything like any common themes that are going on in, in, uh, in the Michigan economy? Yeah. I think the big thing is because the Michigan and, and you're right, Michigan specifically Detroit is, is typically, and will continue to be a laggard, which always, this is always a bad thing. Uh, when you look at our economy, you know, it's, it goes back to world war two you know, the arsenal of democracy. We're a heavy manufacturing economy. You can't really do that remotely. However, the things that, su- that are supporting uh, the manufacturing economy, where you still have hands on wrenches, on screws, on cars, uh, can all be done in a flexible environment. So I think if there was any word or, or, or trend, I think it's a combination of agility meets flexibility. And what I, what I mean that is the two are not the same. Being agile means being able to make decisions quickly. Being flexible means being able to do it from anywhere you can, anywhere you want to. But at the same time, it's where does accountability fit in? And I think that's what a lot of companies right now are trying to figure out. They want to go completely remote. They want to trust their people, but they just don't. Because frankly, I read something great on uh, an HBR yesterday, the Harvard Business Review, that the title of the thing was, your boss still doesn't trust you if you work remote. And it's been three years and it was brilliant. It was actually really well written. And it basically, the the crux of it was he sees your results. He knows that you're getting stuff done, but he much rather it get done between nine and five, as opposed to you running to take the kids to the doctor at 11 o'clock and then picking up lunch at two 30 and going grocery shopping at four and then working on something at seven 38 o'clock at night. They want the eight hours here, not here. Sure. And they don't want them compact as those, as opposed to spread out. I think flexibility and agility are going to be the two X, Y axes, if you will, of the next five years, especially as the endemic or pandemic, whatever you want to call it, starts to ease a little bit more over time. When we get out of the silly season in D.C., the, the focus will go back to more business and private venture. I think in the next 10 years, to maybe 20 years, you're going to see a lot of those covers pulled back, like you mentioned, with cloud migration and what companies are mature and what's not. And you're going to see some big surprises on companies that you thought were mature that really are scratching the surface and companies you go, well, they're probably just a basic consumer of AWS or Google suite or something like that. And they are ears deep and just rolling in it. And you never had any clue that they were such a techno technologically savvy company. There's a lot of companies that I'm working with today that I'm like, you're just getting into your migration journey. Like, and I'm shocked. I'm oh, yeah. genuinely shocked. I didn't realize how many hashtag no cloud people there were in this town. Oh yeah. And I come I come from a world where, you know, my first job was in a data center in what 97-ish. And I had a virtual private server as a product, you know, VPS. Mm-hmm. And that was cloud. Yeah. And it was it was being used by a lot of people. So like, I don't like the adoption thing. Like it almost, it's almost, you know, it's the people that yeah. want to see the green blinking lights are the same people that want to see you working from nine to five are the same people that it's the you know, same people. Yeah. It's yeah. the same or similar people or, or those people train those people. And there's, there hasn't been much diversity of opinion uh, or, or demonstrable result that comes out of that. And it comes back to the idea of trust. You know, they don't trust it, you. It goes back to, yep. Right, right. But it goes back to like what I was saying earlier on is like the evolve and adapt. It's like, how did you maintain a job in IT? Like, who did you bullshit 
to run this hashtag no cloud philosophy, right? And, exactly. and, and you're, you're in a leadership position, like, uh, you know, so it, I'm not telling you to go 100% in, but I'm telling you, you need to look at your workloads, right? At least this consider it. At least consider it. Absolutely. And there's, there, you know, pros and cons for all of it, you know. Um, for sure. Shifting gears a little bit, you, uh, you know, we were working a lot recently together because I uh we have a thing at work called slalom speaks and it's like our little version of ted talks and uh they're like we're assigning you a mentor and i'm like but i already did a ted talk i'm good and they're like no no no, we're assigning you a mentor and i'm like okay cool then i watched what you did and i'm like okay i need a mentor you know and uh hey <laughs> i just want to thank you for 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 putting up with me that whole time but uh you know talk to me about your experience in doing that because there's a lot of uh a lot of people pouring their hearts out in front of our, it's hard to do it in front of your peers. And, uh, it, it, it's, it was, it was an obscenely cool experience. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. And first of all, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that you put up with me because again, you said you've got a ton of experience doing this, Bob. And, um, you know, me mentoring you seems very, very backward. Um, and, and for some intents and purposes it is, but it's purposely done that way. And I had that same conversation with someone who assigned mentors. They're like, Zach, you and Bob are going to be a good foil for one another. Um, and I think you're both going to learn from each other. And hearing that, uh, I was like, yep, that makes a lot of sense. I, I get that. Um, last year, I was you know, pretty new to the company. I think I'd been on board maybe five or six months. And this idea of Slalom Speaks came up. And I said, well, maybe I'll just tell a little bit of a story about, you know, my, my talk was about why character matters today more than ever. Um, and not just personal character, but character in the workplace and character and everything you do. It should be something that guides you first and foremost. And it really evolved into my last now five, six years of life and how I've gone on this roller coaster up and down of, of what does character mean and, and how did I get myself back on the horse? Um, and to this day, uh, you know, still feel like I'm riding uh, a high of over a year now, which is something I haven't done in probably 15, 20 years. Um, but there was a lot that went into it. And I think the, you know, the obscenely cool part about it was how much support there was from the organization to just tell your story, um, and, you know, and, and get into bringing your whole self to work. I mean, we hear that a lot, not just at slalom, but we hear that in other organizations too. We want you to bring your whole self to work. If you've got kids selling Girl Scout cookies, or you've got a charity you're proud of, you know, outside of a couple of very big organizations who don't allow you to do that across the board um, because they don't want to uh, sacrifice their culture or what they've, what they've built. Um, I haven't had a culture like this embrace that since I was in the military. So going on six, seven years and a couple different organizations. I've never had it for what it's worth. Yeah. And it, again, it's, it's the military at large writ large is that culture. There, each unit is a little bit different than the other one. Of course it is. It's no different than what we have in Detroit where, you know, one area of practice is going to be a little bit different than another area of practice. But as a whole, the Detroit market was very open and very honest uh, and very forthcoming about what they thought of, you know, yours, my, my talk, everybody else who spoke over the last couple of years that I've seen, um, you know, and I got plenty of, you know, positive attaboys, but I got some, you know, some interesting, uh, constructive feedback too. Um, and that's fine. That's the whole idea behind it. So, um, you know, me coming out and telling my story about, you know, going from, uh, you know, coming out of the military, finding a job with a, a, you know, a great brand and a great company to ending up, you know, div divorced with my kids, 1,013.2 miles away as the MapQuest crow flies. Uh, for those who remember MapQuest. Uh, and, uh, and moving back home to the Detroit area, uh, selling a 2,400 square foot house to living in an 800 square foot apartment. And how do you, you know, a lot of people, that's it. They get to that box and they're like, oh, that's sayonara. That's it for this guy's uh, time on this planet. Uh, and how did I get back on the horse? And a lot of it just had to do with culture and character and getting the right people in my mind and, and letting the people who were living rent free in my head see their way to the door. So, um, but the reason to come back and mentor was because if I could impart any wisdom, it would be just go up there, tell your story. And I think that's something that we, 
we were able to do for you, Bob, was, you know, go up there and tell your story. And I loved how you led with that. I keep saying it, but that Johnny Cash quote about if you could tell one story to God's face right before you walk through the gates, what's it going to be? I think that should be the tagline for Slalom Speaks. Here now, forever, hold your peace. What's that one thing you want to tell us for 10 minutes that if you never got a chance to tell it again and you told it this one time, you'd be okay with it? Randy, you know that do you know that scene from uh, Walk the Line where Johnny Cash is in front of Sam Phillips and he's singing like some basic gospel song. Sam cuts him off. He's like, "Hey, this is the same crap I hear every day." He goes, "If you if you get hit by a truck right now and you're laying in the ditch and you got you're you're sitting right in front of God and you got to sing one song for him to tell him about your time here, what are you going to sing?" So that's kind of how I let it up, but but the thing is, this was my first time to be able to do this story. Without, you know, without Dave, right? Because we did the TED Talk together and, you know, Dave unfortunately passed, right? And it, it's been lingering going, you know, all right, you know, maybe I got to tell my story. And I didn't start with the whole, you know, I'm not a, you know, we're not thought, you know, leaders and we're not masterminds and mocking everyone. I just kind of, do- we just, I just dove in, you know, about me being, you know, but I, from taking that and having me kick off with that, that it changed the whole thing. And no, I, I, I pre- see, again, another set of eyes. I appreciated it more than, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you go all the way back to what we started about with business outcomes. It's just about having another set of eyes, just another, you know, opinion, if you will. And it doesn't have to be the right one. You don't have to accept it. It's just hearing it. And I think that's the one thing that you see. You dove right in and took the audience for a ride. Uh, perfect closer for that. You had other folks who spoke who were very descriptive, very measured, but it worked for them and it worked for their story. And your approach might not have worked as well for their approach and vice versa. So again, it goes back to that idea of being very personal with it and figuring out what works. But I think, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head and it's a good way to to end the podcast, but like that's kind of management consulting, not just the other set of eyes, but like, you know, looking at, I've done what 400, this is a 448th podcast I've recorded. Most of them, some of them are hour and a half, two hours. Some of them are half an hour uh, lately. I've done 150, 200 other podcasts. I've guested on another hundred, you know, I've done public speaking at least you know, I would say 100, 150 times in my career, you know, for work, the sales pitches in front of boardrooms, you know, 300, 500 times. And yet I still, you know, another set of eyes shape what was a altogether better message. So no, I, uh, I think that's management consulting 101. Absolutely. It's got to be a diversity of opinion. If you get the same looking people, same five people in the room, same suit and tie, you're never going to get anywhere ever. That's right. You know, I'm going to get into a rant, social media rant. I hate the people that are like, you know, they don't think like me. I'm going to, I just want to be in my little echo chamber. Like I totally pride myself in having a diverse set of friends and groups and people that don't think like me. Um, not, you know, I don't want them to change my mind, but I just want to see, I just want to know how people, you know, be your, be you, be your individual. Right. It's just, yeah. I don't want to echo chamber would be boring, man. Like it was kind of a, I wrote a thing a long time ago about hiring and I said, I don't want 12 Superman or 12 Wonder Woman. That would be boring. I want Aquaman. Cause you need, you know, I need Batman. I need, you know, I need Apache chief. I need, I need the, you know, I need the justice league. Right. So yeah, everyone's got their strengths. Everyone's got their weaknesses. And you know, if one person can raise one person, that's that idea. I'll go back to my military side, you know, rising tide raises all ships. And if you can get one person to bring everyone else up that much, that's everyone collectively coming up that much. And if everybody's game raises that much, you're only going to see positivity. It's the idea of if you can get 1% better every day, then you are going to be a force to be reckoned with by the end of a year. Uh, just that based on that 1%, you know, then you're 365% better, right? It's like Scott Steiner math at that point. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It's pop a pump out right there. So you have 33 and one third percent chance of winning. Um, on that note, <laughs> Zach, I'm going to cut you <laughs> loose, man. I sincerely appreciate your time. Uh, it's always a great conversation. I always like spending time with you. We're going to put your uh, LinkedIn and everything in the, uh, in, in uh, our show notes, but uh, I can't thank you enough. Zach Bogus uh management consultant, uh, appreciate the time. Uh, on behalf of Bob and Randy, do us all a favor. Drink up your drinks. Get your phone numbers. You don't got to go home. You just got to get the hell out of here. See you next week. Drive careful. Beat awesome it. Awesome stuff, everyone.